All right, very good. So we're going to talk about standards today. Setting standards, raising standards, following standards, all about standards today. So let me open it up here to a question. Feel free to either unmute yourselves or put some answers in the chat box. What are certain companies that you think of when you think of high standards? What are companies that you think of, you can unmute yourself and put it in the chat box, that you think about when the term high standards comes into play, what are certain companies or brands that you think of? Nordstrom. Nordstrom's, okay, Nordstrom's, high standards, got it, all right. I agree. The Ritz-Carlton. Ritz-Carlton, Ritz-Carlton, high standards, sure, what else? Four Seasons. Four Seasons, absolutely. I see Starbucks in the chat box absolutely good 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 who else rolls who else royce what is it amir rolls royce rolls royce high standards sure 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 okay cool 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 who else who else do you think of with high standards what other companies do you think about or brands do you think about with high standards All right, I've got like five people paying attention. That's great. All right, so we'll just. <laughs> oh, look at Eric, you sly devil, you. Century 21 masters, of course, of course. Okay, great. So we've got some brands. We've got some brands that we think about when we think about high standards. So I wrote the question down. What brand do you think you are most comparable to in your business when it comes to standards? Do you set your standards as a Rolls Royce or do you set your standards as a different car dealership? Do you set your standards as a Ritz Carlton Four Seasons or is it more of a motel type of standards? Okay. What are the standards that you set for yourself and what if somebody were to say, oh, high standards, what is, how do they compare you to those companies? So it's, it's an important question. But let me ask you this. What makes those companies, what are some of the standards that those companies have that you, gives them the impression of high standards? What do they do? What, how, how do you see them as having high standards? Superior customer service. Superior customer service. Okay, great. So superior customer service. What else? Or what parts of superior customer service? If there's an issue, they try to resolve it as quickly as possible. Like, for example, I own three Mercedes, and whenever I call, they know my name. They want to service my cars right away. Uh, they always have time for me. They always have a loaner for me, so they're quick. They're quick. They're quick. They got a solution. They'll fix it. We got loaners we know your name make you feel important okay good what else what else do some of these other companies do that gives them the perception of high standards what else that's it superior customer service and they're they're quick that's it that's all we got boy this is going to be a really boring class because apparently this is all figured out hospitality hospitality okay that's perfect Albert, what about Lexus? Does Lexus give you any service? No, they don't care about me, D. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, so here we go. Now, now we know the opposite of Rolls Royce, Mercedes. Is uh, thank you, Robert. Apparently, thank Lexus you. <laughs> does not care about Albert. No, Lexus is really good, actually. Okay. They they're, they're, they're always want to make sure they give you options, and they want to make sure if you have any questions, they take care of you very good. At least that, that's been my experience, so. Okay. Good. Thank you, Abigail. So, so Donna says over deliver right in the chat box. Yeah. Over deliver. He, here's why I ask and what could be concerning, I guess. I know some of you are not responding because you're not paying attention. I'm aware of that. And I know some of you are not responding because you don't care. Okay. But some of you are not responding because you don't know what high standards these companies have. 
The concern is then if you do, if you can't identify what high standards are, you probably don't have high standards in your business. Because if you can't identify it, you can't implement it. This is why I did this little exercise to start this out. So write this down. What standards do I implement in my business? And number two, do I really stick to them? And then write down number three, what is the cost if I don't stick to my standards? So Melinda had shared a story just right now of, of someone, she had an appointment, they no-showed, they rescheduled and they no-showed again. And then they reached out to her and she said, no, I don't want to work with you anymore. So her standard was two no-shows, that's it. You missed two appointments, you know, show two appointments. That's it. I'm not working with you no matter what your situation is. But I wrote this down here. If your standards are not in writing, you don't know what your standards are. They have to be in writing. So you can't just say, I have high standards. Oh, I think I have good standards. I have set standards. Run them off for me. What are they? Some of you can do that. Some of you can't. But I also wrote down here, just because you have good standards doesn't mean you can't have great standards. Let me give you an example, okay? Let me give you an example. So I, in the past, I like going to, to Macy's and buy, to buy suits. I think, you know, Macy's is always very good. They're good to me. They got good suits, decent prices, things like that. Always been very fine with Macy's. Customer service was fine. They helped me out. They do whatever, blah, blah, blah. Got it, right? Everything's very good. You wouldn't think anything different of it. I have no reason not to go there. Fine. So recently, uh, we went to Nordstrom's. Nordstrom's was having their anniversary sale. And I, not because I have anything against Nordstrom's. I just never really had gone there to, to buy anything. But we went there. And they had some really great deals on some suits. I haven't bought a suit in a while. I haven't bought a suit in so long that I actually forgot what my size was. Okay. Now I've got 20 suits in the closet. <laughs> I couldn't remember what my size was. 40, 42, 44, 46. I don't know. So I put one jacket on. It was enormous. I was like, nope, that's not the one. But we go and get these suits and they have this really great price. That's not really relevant. But I go there and... They, I say, yeah, I got to figure out the price. They get you up on this. They get you into the dressing room and they get you up on this stand and you're up there and you feel like a king and they're measuring you. They're here to there. They're doing all these other things. So then you try the suit on, right? And I wasn't in a suit. That's so why I just had my regular shoes on. And they say, no, 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 we got to match the shoes. So they open up this closet and they have stacks of brown shoes and black dress shoes of all different sizes so that way you can try on the shoes to see how it looks with the suit. So I was buying a blue suit. So they got me some brown shoes. So I put these brown shoes on. They're all clean and good. And they're hemming me up and doing all these other different things. And then they said, well, we got to, you're not going to wear that t-shirt, obviously. So let's get you another shirt. Now I understand this is part of an upsell. I'm aware. Okay. But they go and the lady goes out and gets me a shirt that would fit the blue suit. So I put that on. So I'm like fully dressed because they want to make sure this all works out. Then the guy's measuring and he's like, see this right here. We got it. We're going to trim this up right here. We're going to hem this up. And it's all part of the deal. And there's like three or four people running around to make sure that everyone here is serviced. The point about, and here's the thing. I was only buying one suit. I wasn't buying 15 suits. I was just buying one suit. But the point is, Macy's was good. Service was fine. But boy, when I went to Nordstrom's, that was a different experience. So the point I bring to you is that you might have good service and you might think, yeah, my service is great. My standards are great. But that doesn't mean there's not another level. And the other level is where you get the long-term business. The other level is where you can charge more because Nordstrom's is more expensive than Macy's for the suits. 
But when they're given that level of service and that level of standards, you pay the price. So you have to be willing to know that you're of good standards doesn't mean you can't go to great standards. All right. It's very, very important. So help me out here a little bit. What are some standards that we could or should live by as real estate agents? What are some standards? Help me, help me, help me, help me. Stick to the schedule, stick to the script. Stick to, okay, so stick to your schedule. So my standard is I create a schedule and I'm going to stick to the schedule every day, okay? Or I'm going to stick to the script every day. All right, Ray put choosing to be good or great as a choice. That's right, that's true. That's true. Always pre qualify Always pre-qualify, 100% of the people, 100% of the time. Even if it's your family. Oh, my mother wouldn't waste my time. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Come on. Always pre-qualify. There you go. What else? What other standards could you have in your business? What are some other things? Does nobody give a shit about this topic? I got other stuff I can talk about. <laughs> I mean, I got other stuff. I got plenty of material. The kind of um, the type of client that we decide to work with, that's a standard. The type, Yeah, absolutely. The type of client you want to work with. Whether we want to work with buyers or sellers, the price range and the areas. I, yeah. I think that is, I mean. Absolutely. I, absolutely. At the, price at the range. Retreat, that's what Buyers, I heard. Sellers, yeah. location, 100%, right? Absolutely. The type of client I see here, uh, Donna says, stay up to date on research regarding home sales so I can let the sellers know. Market data, knowing your stats, that's a standard. Great. Maricela says, return calls and emails in a timely fashion. That's great. Lynn says, 6% commission. Great. Okay. These are all standards that we can live by. Absolutely. So my, my next question is, number one is, do you have these written down in your business plan? Do you have these written down in a sheet that says, these are my minimum standards to work with somebody? These are my minimum standards for my business. So if the answer is no, number one, don't be upset. That's normal. Most people don't have these things written down. But as a homework assignment, write out what your minimum standards are and have them in front of you all the time. Because when we're prospecting, do we sometimes break what our standards are? 100%. Present company included. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Present company included. You think when we haven't recruited somebody in a week or two that I'm not acting a little bit desperate? Come on. Of course we are. But if they're not, the standards aren't written in front of me, I'm willing to break them. Oh, you're only working part-time 10 hours a week? I could make it work. <laughs> we could get you a couple deals. That's not going to happen. But we got to get the numbers. Oh, you want to sell your home for $1.2 million and it's an $800,000 area? Sure. Listing appointment on the board. Oh, you want to go see property, but you're not pre-approved? That's okay. Let's go see it. I got a, I got a buyer because they're not written. Write out your standards, have them listed out. The second thing I wrote down here is be specific. So give you an example. So Marty Sella brought up a good point, return calls and emails in a timely manner. What's a timely manner? Because here's why I bring that up, because the old Mike Ferry system says that you should stay in touch with your sellers every once a week, every Friday. Do you think Touching base with your sellers once a week in today's markets enough? No. 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 No, absolutely not. So you have to sometimes adjust what your standards are. Because if you tell your seller, hey, we listed your property on Saturday, I'll call you on Friday. That seller's going to go, where the hell are you going? <laughs> what, what are you doing for the next six days? I expect my home to be sold in escrow by next Friday. So you have to be specific. What is email call in a timely fashion? 
staying up to date on your market research. What does that mean? How often? How big of an area? Right? How often do you study the market? What stats do you know? Ray talked about earlier, brought up a great point. What kind of clients do we want to work with? Okay, well, let's be specific. You want to work with sellers or buyers? Well, I want to work with predominantly sellers. Okay, so here's a great standard. That, this is actually one of the standards we set with one of our agents after the retreat. How many buyers are you willing to work with at one time? That's a standard. Now, for some of you, you, it might be infinite because you need the business and that's okay. For some of you, you might be generating enough listings where you can say, look, I'm willing to work with two buyers at a time. And if I get another qualified, motivated buyer, then that means I just have to replace one of the other two. But I could only be actively showing to two, three, one, whatever the case may be. How many can you handle at one time? Price points. Is there a minimum price point? Melinda recently set a minimum of her price points got to be 350, 350 or above. Won't take it, won't take a listing below 350. Won't take a buyer out below 350. Is there a certain price point that you're not willing to go below? Lynn brought up commission. Is there a certain commission you're not willing to go below? So, so you know, is it 6%? Do you focus on the total commission or do you have to say, I'm only going to focus on, I have to get at least X. What the, we'll figure out the buyer side, but my minimum standards, I got to get X. Or is it a dollar amount? For some of you that work in the multi-million dollar areas, it might not be a percentage. It might be a dollar amount. Give you an example. Remember Christoph Chu. Now, I don't, I don't know if anyone works here in the Beverly Hills area, but remember Christoph Chu was, you know, selling that home for like $10 million. And the seller says, I'm only going to pay you a flat fee of this. And it was like the total. So the commission would have been like 1.25% or something, but it was like $150,000 or some ridiculous amount to him. So he's like, okay, yeah, I'll do it. So maybe if you work in a high end area, is it a percentage of a minimum commission standard or is it a certain dollar amount? What about an area? Well, my standard is I don't go outside this border. Well, what? Well, specify those areas. Because if you work in Arcadia and you say, I'm going to work the whole 210 corridor. Well, the 210 goes out to Moreno Valley. So does that mean you're going to go out there too? No. Okay. Well, then what is it? Well, it's the 210 to the 605 down to the 10 over to the 710. That, that square. Okay, great. So you have to be specific with the standards that you're setting. Pre-qualifying, do pre-qualifying. Are you willing to pre-qualify every client 100% of the time, 100% of the questions? Or are you going to not do that? So be specific with the standards that you're setting for yourself and the standards that you're setting for your client. But I wrote down this next, once you identify what your standards are and you write out your standards and you're very specific with your standards, it's okay to share your standards with your clients. So they understand the type of person they're working with because if they don't think you have high standards, they will take advantage of you. Guaranteed. If you work with a buyer and you go show them property and they're not pre-approved, they know right off the bat that they are in control. So when you want to go see property, it's going to be on their schedule. When you want to write up an offer, it's what they want to write up. They're in control because they know ah, she doesn't really have standards. He doesn't really have standards. I said, I said no to this, yes to that, and they just kind of they just kind of do the dance. If you go to if a, a seller knows that their home is overpriced, they know it. So if you go, yeah, no problem, we'll take the listing, and they know it's overpriced, they'll go, ah, this, they'll do they'll do anything for a buck. You no longer have Rolls Royce. 
Ritz-Carlton standards. No, 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 no. You're that motel in between Baker and Vegas. You know, that still advertises that they have color TV. You know, that's the new standards when you're doing that. Now, remember the other question I asked you to write down at the very beginning is what's the cost? What's the cost of, the, of, my, of me breaking my standards or not having standards? And I wrote down here, the cost is your business, your entire business, whether or not you make it in real estate or not. Low standards can get you through a year or two. Low standards will be out of the business in three to five years. At least out of the business where you can make enough money to live in California. There are plenty of people with low standards that have had their license for 40 years and they do one or two, maybe three or four deals. But that's not enough to make a living. The cost of not having standards, not following them is your business. High standards is the only way to make it past that two year honeymoon phase. Because the first two years, nobody knows whether or not you have standards. They're willing to give it a shot, but it will catch up to you. It will catch up to you. I wrote down here, the cost of low standards is your time. Because if you don't have standards and you take a listing that you know can't sell, how much time is that affecting you? How much time are you spending on that listing? How many time, how much time did you spend preparing for that listing, driving to that listing, going on the presentation, marketing it, uploading it to the MLS, hours and hours and hours of time that could have been done searching for someone else that was really ready to buy or sell. Showing a buyer that's not fully qualified or fully motivated. How much time, how many hours went into that? So not only did you lose the time, you lost the next potential deal because you could have used that time to find another deal and someone else did. And you lost the mental edge because now you're mentally exhausted. You lost a deal. They didn't, they didn't buy or sell. You're a little bit down on yourself. Your mindset's a little hit. Ego's a little hit. This is really expensive. <laughs> This is, this is really expensive. Not simply by not having standards. Simply by not having standards. But I wrote down here, when you have high standards, people recognize you have high standards and you will be treated differently. That's why... That's why nobody questions the Ritz Carlton when they charge $800 for a 250 square foot hotel room. Nobody questions it. It's the Ritz. I'm just happy to be here. Nobody questions Fleming Steakhouse when they charge you $60 for a steak. Nobody questions it. It's Fleming's. Steaks high end, service is great, no big deal. Nobody questions it when they know that the standards are high. But now imagine that motel in between Baker and Vegas says, we're gonna charge you 250 bucks for the night. And you're like, what the hell? I'll gladly pay 800 at the Ritz, but I'm not paying you 250. Starbucks, you know, we mentioned Starbucks earlier, high, high standards. You want to talk about high standards? Hey, uh, I'll, have a, I'll have a coffee with some cream and sugar. Great. That'll be $4.75 for a coffee. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Here you go. You don't question it. But the coffee at the gas station, can't charge you 475 because it's gas station coffee. You have to do it. You have to raise your standards. But I wrote down here, raise your standards to the person that you want to be, not the person that you are. 
Raise your standards to the person you want to be, not the person that you are. Not to say that you don't have great standards or you're not doing amazing things, but is it fair to assume that all of us want to achieve more? Yes? So Sonia and I, that's great. Okay. Because again, you're good now or you're great now, but doesn't mean you can't achieve better. So what are the standards that those people above you are doing? So now I wrote down here, think about in your own business, who do you mentor? Who do you, I, don't, I hate the word idolize because it kind of makes it too big of a deal, but who do you look up to? Who do you think is really great in our business? And then what are their standards? And then implement your standards to meet or exceed their standards. So here's a great example. For those of you that have been around Mike Ferry for a while, he tells the story all the time about Mike Darna. Mike Darna is a real estate agent down in Florida and personally, one of my absolute favorite people in the entire Mike Ferry organization. I just think he's, I mean, there's a lot of amazing people. But Mike Darna is high on that list for me. And he tells a story about Mike Darna Here's a guy who's been doing 150, 200 deals for 20 years, and his closing ratio wasn't very high on his listings. And so Mike Ferry told Mike Darda, you have to raise your standards. And Mike Darda at the time said, I don't really have any standards. Now think about this. This guy's doing 150 deals a year, and he doesn't have his standards written out. So Mike says, okay, let's write some standards. So some of his standards were you have to pre-qualify 100% of the people 100% of the time. And if they, at any point, they don't answer any of the questions, you move on. Well, what if it's a past client? They have to answer all the questions. What if it's a family member? They have to answer all the questions. 100% of the time, no questions asked. Mike Darda says, okay, great. You have to get a minimum. He, he asked Mike, what is the minimum commission you'll take? Mike says, my commission has to be 3%. He says, okay, great. Then you have to take a minimum of 3% commission for you. Because he understands that 6%, you know, you try to get six, but sometimes they don't want to pay five. But you got to get 3% for you. No questions asked. Okay, great. What's the minimum contract length? Six months. Okay, no questions asked. Well, what if they want to do four? And I know it's a really well-priced property. Six months, Mike. Okay, no problem. What's the max overprice you're willing to go? Well, I'm willing to take a listing that's, you know, 5% overpriced. Okay, great. If it's more than 5% overpriced, you're not going to take it. Okay. But you got to have a price reduction strategy. So we list out all these different things in terms of standards. Mike Darda writes them out and he followed them because he's super coachable, follows them. And he went from taking 16 listings a month, but on 30 appointments to only going on 19 appointments and still taking 16 listings. And it was because of the standards that he increased because he found that a lot of those appointments he was going on weren't real sellers because he wasn't pre-qualifying 100% of the time because he wasn't going after his commission. He wasn't setting his standards. So he got the same amount of business in less time. So guess what he gets back? It's time. Now you have a choice. You get your time. You can either put it back in your business, which he didn't because he was getting the same amount of business. He took that time and put it to his kids because he, at the time he did this, his kids were younger. Now his son actually just got his real estate license and just joined him in the business. But he took that time and put it back to the family. 11 listing appointments he saved. That's a lot of hours because he raised his standards by pre-qualifying every single person. And if they didn't go with every question, he got rid of it. The cost of not following your standards is huge. And the cost of following that is a fortune. You're working with buyers. Ever had a buyer say, well, I'll work with you, but if you, get, you give me a kickback, yeah? I'll work with you, but you give me a kickback at closing. I got a better idea. Why don't you kick rocks right now? We'll just have a better day. I'm not giving you any of my money. But will you do that? Don't tell them to go kick rocks. Okay. But will you tell them to leave? Or will you say, well, okay, it's a buyer. Buyer commissions are going down, folks. 
We see it all the time. So you're getting less commission as a buyer's agent than you're willing to give some of it to the client with, that you did all the work for. So they get the house and the money, come on. But if you don't have that standard, you'll take it. And the buyer knows that because the first time you let them in, they're gonna, what are they gonna do? You think they're gonna stop at 500 bucks? Hell no. Because the first time that inspection comes in and the seller doesn't give them all the credits, who are they gonna turn to first? You. Hey, can you pitch in an extra 500? Can you pitch in a thousand? Because they know you got no standards, they're gonna come for more. Make or break your business by the standards. But I go back to the beginning. What brand do you wanna be associated with? When people think of you as a real estate agent, what brand do you want them to associate you with? Oh, Robert Hertel, yeah, he's, he's the Rolls Royce standards. He's got four season standards. If they don't think of you in that way, they're not gonna refer you business either. Because you've never once ever, ever had someone come back and say, hey, you know what? I'll tell you what, if you are ever, ever in the gas lamp district in San Diego, you got to stay at the motel down on second and main. They're never going to, no one's ever recommended that. But they've said, oh, if you're staying in downtown San Diego, stay at the Hard Rock. Oh my gosh, great. Unbelievable. All this other different stuff. Standards, 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 standards. It's boring right? It's not cool. It's not interesting, but it's what you need. So your homework assignment is to write out your standards. What are your standards for you, yourself, and your business? But I also wrote down here, you can't have good standards in business if you don't have good standards at home. It's just impossible to do. It's just impossible to do. You can't say, well, my standard is that I'm super professional. When they see me, they see a pro. And then at home, they see a slob. Doesn't it work, okay? Well, my business standard is I'm always on time. I am punctual. I'm never late for a meeting. I'm never late for an appointment. If somebody wants me to call them back at three o'clock, I'm calling them back at three o'clock on the dot. But in my personal life, if we have a lunch meeting at two o'clock with some friends, I'll be there at 2.30. Doesn't work. Your standards in your business and your standards in your personal life have to mesh together. I can't be cool, calm, and collected at work and then at home, I'm a maniac, yelling, screaming, running around, reckless. Can't be a bad spouse and a good agent. Can't be, a, can't be a bad parent and a good listing agent. Just can't do it. If you can't manage kids, you're not going to be able to manage adults. I mean, because a kid, all you got to do is give them chocolate. Adults. <laughs> I don't know, man. But that's the point. So don't just set standards for yourself and your business. You have to have standards for who you are as a person outside of real estate as well. They have to mesh together, just the way it goes, okay? Super duper important, super duper important. Questions on any of this stuff that we went over today? Uh, Robert? Yes. Yeah, I just wanna ask you, I know when you say we as a realtors to have a, an ex, a, you know, a standards, which is real good, now, when you're dealing with sellers, I'm talking about sellers and buyers, that they don't have that standards because like you're talking about Christoph, he got a $10 million hype end property. They probably, they go to Fleming's every weekend and still they want to reduce the commission. People has that mentality, unfortunately, because our services. Now, in that case, we're looking with the seller's mentality and seller's standard. How are we dealing in that? We just let them go and say, no, I, I do this. And if it's not, give it to the next one. Is that the way we do it? Well, so it's a great question, Michael. And that to that point is that you have to make what's called a business decision. 
So that that applies to kind of it's it's, it's a great question. It's it's it applies to what we had talked about that Christoph Chu example, and we just had an agent do this exact same thing, where it wasn't about the percentage; it was about the total dollar amount. So if you have a ten million dollar listing and they say I'm not going to pay, I, I'm not paying two and a half percent. I'm not paying two percent. I'll pay you 1%. That's all I'm going to pay you. Okay, well, it's 100 grand. So the question is, you have a business decision to make. Do I walk away because I'm only getting 1% or do I take it because I'm getting $100,000? So you have to really, that's why it, it's, when you get to the high-end properties, you have to consider the business decision side of things and not just go for a percentage because when you're doing a $400,000 property, you could say, well, look, I'm getting two and a half, three percent, whatever your commission is. That's fine because it's only $400,000. I say only $400,000. That crazy in California, like that's only 400 grand. <laughs> Pittsburgh, they're going, that's a mansion. Um, but, you know, you can do percentages there, but the higher you get, you have to make a business decision. We had an agent that the listing was, was $2 million. It wasn't even $10 million. It was $2 million. And the seller said, I'm only going to pay you 1.5%. And if you try to charge me any more than that, then just walk away. So the agent goes, okay, well, gosh, you know, I, I, want, I would like to get at least 2 to 2.5% 2 for every deal, but 1.5% on $2 million, and it would sell. That's $30,000. They took the listing. Because from a business decision, it was a well-priced property that they're going to get paid $30,000 on. So you have to make a business decision for some of these higher end properties of, is it a percentage or is it a dollar amount? And it also depends on the motivation of the seller. So if you have a client that's, you know, I, I, it's a $2 million listing, but the property is probably only worth $1.6 and they also want you to cut your commission, then it's like, all right, well, now I'm cutting my commission and doing all this work for a listing that's not probably not going to sell or they're not super motivated. So you have to just make a business decision based on some of those things. But if it, you set a standard and if it goes below that standard, so if you say, well, look, I'm not going to take a listing for, I have to make at least $30,000 on a listing and they only want to pay you 20,000 because it's a, you know, $2.5, $3 million property, then you do have a decision to make. Is it below my standards and I walk away or do I take it? So you have to make a business decision on some of those things. The higher end properties also, you have to remember too, is that there's not as many referrals passed around. So they just want to know that the property got sold. So you can cut your commission and take more of a dollar amount on the higher end properties. The problem with cutting your commission on a $400,000 property is that every time you get referred, they're also going to ask you to cut your commission. So that one commission cut on a $2 million property, they're going to, let's say they refer you to another $2 million person. Okay, great. I'm, I have to cut my commission again, but I'm still making $25,000, $30,000. If I cut my commission at 400,000 and I'm only getting one, one and a half percent, they refer me somebody else, I'm gonna have to take one and one and a half percent for them. And then so on and so forth. And then you just become this total discount commission person. So that's why it's the lower the price, the higher the standards have to be in terms of percentages. You become food for less. Yeah, yeah, there you go. You, there you go, Sonia. You become food for less, yeah. Because that's what they're going to do. You know, if someone's going to refer you, they're going to go, oh, yeah, Robert was great, actually. And he only charged me 1% to the listing. Oh, great. Well, hey, Robert, I want to list my house and you sold so-and-so's for 1%. We'd like to do the same thing. You're like, <laughs> it sucks. So you have to be careful with that. Robert, I have a question. This isn't really about standards, but to me, I'm thinking like, this. if I allow this, to happen with every client then it does push my standards like the time that i'm going to put in i have a client that wants to buy a six hundred thousand dollar home or want to look at yet they only have two thousand dollars in their savings like i don't want to show them property because I don't. I don't think that they're mentally ready for it 
because I came in safe. I don't even know if it's a mental thing. I don't think they're going to qualify. They do qualify, but they don't save. I okay. I I, I mean I I okay. I mean I believe that they qualify. I guess it's pretty wild. It's a, it's a VA. It's I know, a VA, but you sorry. still you still need money for cl- cost and things yeah, like that. Yeah, closing costs. Yeah. I mean, so look at it, it, the if they qualify and they want to buy the house. Let them buy the house. It's not, it's not, it's not your problem if they don't save. It's not your problem if they if it's not really mentally or um, financially in their best interest. Your job is to help them buy and sell a house if they want to. And if they say we don't, we don't, we can't save for nothing, but we'll guarantee you we'll make the house payment. Okay, great. Let's get your house. See, you know, don't you know, remove yourself from the situation. Okay. I understand what you're saying, and it's it's a dilemma that we run into a lot. But let me tell you, the truth is, the truth is, if we got involved with that, we'd probably help. We wouldn't help very many people because most people that buy homes, from a savings perspective, probably shouldn't be buying it because most people can't save money. That's not a. I'm not saying that in a negative way. That's just the truth of the matter. Most people's money is if they if they lose their job or miss a paycheck they're not going to make their mortgage payment so we can't get too caught up in in those kind of things <clears throat> but i get it i get it all right everybody good stuff well hopefully there was one or two things there that were helpful for you but i do challenge you to identify what your standards are raise your standards remember you can go from good to great so hopefully there's a couple of good things in there all right That's all I...